so much for joining me today. So the idea of this interview is that my company, Energy Rise, I want to bring uh, mindfulness and as many different techniques as possible to um, as wide an audience as I can reach. Uh, some people just jump straight into the experience and I feel that some people need to understand the workings of the brain and the benefits of what's happening when they do their mindfulness practice. Um, so for the audience, I'm joined by Tamara Russell, who is a clinical psychologist, a martial artist and a neuroscientist. I'd like to explain to the audience kind of what's happening in the mind during a mindfulness practice. And I know that you've come up with a technique, um, a four part technique. So, yeah, I'd like to know more about that and explain to people what is happening during your, yeah, during the mind, during, in the brain, during mindfulness. Thank you, yeah. So the variant of mindfulness that I teach is this blend of kind of neuroscience, martial arts, clinical psychology, just uh, mash it all in together. Um, but I do particularly like to go to the neuroscientific research to try and find out what's the mechanism, you know, what is the brain actually doing? And then designing practices that are targeting the brain networks that we need to train. So the model is something that comes from a piece of research that was conducted by somebody called Wendy Hassenkamp, so I'm really keen to to honor her contribution. Uh, and she did a, a study where she looked at what happens in a mindfulness of the breath exercise. So typically we're attending to the breath, the mind wanders, we notice, and then we get back to the breath. Mm -hmm. And she showed that when people are in the brain scanner doing this exercise, they activate three particular networks of the brain. The attention network is harnessed when we very deliberately need to choose the breath as the object for the attention. Then when the mind starts wandering, which probably many people have experienced, it's kind of like attention on the breath dims. And what comes to mind is thinking about all the emails that I've got to send and picking up dinner and is my kid okay at school and blah, 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 blah. So we have this sense of the attention network is engaged and then it comes off and the default mode network comes on. This is the kind of thinking, planning, imagining, mind wandering space. And then there's something called the salience network, which is kind of just chilling out in the background, but we've seeded it with our intention. So the salience network is kind of just hanging out and seeing what's going on. Uh, and when you're on the breath, it's kind of kicking back and it's saying, yeah, you're on the breath. I just can, okay, carry on. You're on the breath. But when it starts seeing that you're on emails, it kind of comes to life and says, oh, Tamara, uh, I see that you were wanting to be on the breath. And actually now you're thinking about emails. <laughs> Clash you know, you're not doing what you thought you were doing, what would you like me to do next? Yeah. Mm. So these three networks are activated and, you know, they have strong links to what's going on with our mental health, how we use our attention for productivity, how we use our minds for creativity. Um, but the 4321 model that I kind of, you know, drew from this research and, and kind of developed and, and went a bit wild with <laughs> is, you know, there are four stages in that model. There's attending to the object that we've chosen there's mind wandering there's noticing that the mind has wandered and then there's doing something about it which if you want to train your brain is getting back to the breath mm -hmm. so attending mind wandering noticing getting back so when i'm helping people to practice mindfulness i'm like where are you in that loop mindfulness is not this magical place at least not for a beginner where you're just like, oh, I'm so mindful. Actually, when you start mindfulness training, the thing that really comes to your awareness is, I'm totally not mindful. My mind is so busy, I never realized. Oh my goodness, I thought I could attend to the breath. I thought I was good at paying attention. And I just realized I can't do it for more than half a second. Mm. So that's the four, the four stages. The three brain networks, attention, default mode, and salience network. When the salience network is activated, it re-harnesses the attention network to come back in again. And there's some kind of subdivisions of the attention network as well, but maybe you don't need to know all of that detail. Um, but some of the attention is you know, focusing and some of it is noticing that there's a clash and then some of it is redirecting, pulling the attention back to where you want it to be. The two secret ingredients then are actually, this whole activity sits in a bed of what am I actually doing and why, which for me is intention, mm -hmm. and compassion. Because your mind will wander. And when it does, and you kind of pop out of this loop, it's really important that you know what you were doing. Oh yeah, I was on the breath. <laughs> 
and why you were doing it. Because otherwise, when you go to come back, your brain will just be like, well, what was I doing? Oh, I can't even remember what I was doing. Was I on the breath or am I feeling my bum on the chair or am I supposed to be on sounds or what am I doing? And then there's another bit of mind that goes, yeah, but why are you doing this? Because it's really boring and it's really hard and it's really effortful and oh, look at all those people in the room. They must be all doing it and you're not doing it because you're rubbish. You know, so all of this is very predictable, this stuff. So I like to prepare people and say, look, be really clear especially in secular mindfulness, why are you doing it? And that helps them to quickly get back in the loop so they can stay training their brain. The compassion piece is important is because you will fail at mindfulness. So I know there's a lot of teachers that say, well, there's no right or wrong, and it's all no right or wrong. Well, if you've asked your brain to be on the breath and you're thinking about emails, well, I'm sorry, there is a wrong. You're not doing it. You know, you're really, you're not doing it. But what's different with mindfulness is we don't get punitive about this. We might notice that we're quite judgy to begin with, but the secret ingredient is be okay that you've got it wrong. Be okay that you're not doing it right. The quicker you can be okay with the fact that you're not doing it right, the quicker you can get back. Mm -hmm. And it's in that sort of stage three of the model where you notice, oh, I'm not on the breath. I say to my students, What's the tone of voice that you use with yourself there? Have you got a big wagging finger? Like, no, Tamara, you're not on the breath. You're totally wrong. You're doing it rubbish and you might as well give up now because you're never going to be able to do it. And many minds are like that. Mm -hmm. And what we want to shift that to is, wow, Tamara's brain, look at you go. You are a wonder. You're so amazing. Look at how fast you go to all of these other things that are not breath. I love you. But I was on the breath. <laughs> so it's that gentleness, the acceptance, the kind of, wow, my mind is like not what I thought, but also the firmness. Mm. And this is actually what the research tells us is the, is the secret ingredient of mindfulness is changes in this internal self-compassionate voice. It really is at the heart of everything. Mm contemplative traditions would agree with that too yeah I often find with the, my students that they always they a question that keeps coming up is yeah when will I get to the mindfulness that it's just peace and like how does, does it ever stop like can you ever stop your mind wandering and actually your the, what you just explained has actually given me uh, an example to explain to them actually mindfulness is is about this process it's yes. about the cycle and and that is mindfulness actually becoming aware it's about the awareness of the cycle and awareness of what your mind does bringing in compassion to that and um yeah it's really lovely to have the framework because i think a lot of the time mindfulness just feels like this huge field of unknown and people get overwhelmed and so to have a a structure like that and also to realize don't beat yourself up but also that that is the process the, the circle motion of that and it, that never stops. Maybe you can catch it quicker and spend more time in this lovely uh, word state, but actually it's not, the goal is not that. And I think you said something before that was lovely about it. It's like a spring clean. Every time you do the, cy the circle, it gets less distracted. And, like, and so you can kind of, yeah, I love the idea that it's a, a spring clean that you kind of keep coming back to and, and uh, keep clearing yourself. That's mindfulness, I guess, in a way as well. Yeah. Well, and I like to share this kind of um, old school laminates here, uh, my low tech approach. So this would be the kind of cycle that we would see in a, in a classic practice, mindfulness of the breath. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, this is not a breathing exercise. There's no need to modify the breath or change the breath. And I specifically point to that when I'm teaching people who are practiced in yoga, because yoga is the science of the breath and there's a million things you can do with the breath. But if you were doing a kind of more, what I would call formal mindfulness training of the breath, there's no need to change the breath. You just have to set your intention to pay attention to it. So here's the focused attention on breath. Could be in the nostril, could be in the tummy. You've got options. Two seconds later, or maybe even less, if you've got my busy monkey mind, uh, the mind starts wandering. And this is then that the attention network has dimmed and the default mode network is springing into action. Sometimes it's thinking about the breath, and this is a common mistake. 
that many people make. They think they're paying attention and meditating on the breath, and they're actually thinking about the breath. Mm. Yeah, so that's yeah. different. Raw sensations of the breath versus thinking about the breath. I would call that task-related mind wandering. Or they might be doing something else which I call non-task-related mind wandering. And this is the shopping list, the to-do list, the thinking about, you know, I don't know, all the other things, zoning out, sleeping, getting into this states of torpor. Oh, I'm so nice and relaxed, I'm so nice. But you've lost contact. You've lost contact with the present moment and the breath. Then in here comes the voice of the instructor. Notice where the mind is now. This voice penetrating the mind like, oh, literally waking us up, literally waking us up and, and helping the salience network to get activated and go, hey, you're not on the breath anymore. You're thinking about something else or you're thinking about the breath. What do you want to do next? Mm -hmm. And there you've got a choice. If you're having a good old mind wander, I mean, no problem. You can go back to mind wandering. Great, go for it. You know, maybe it is a really important list that you're creating in your mind. But if you've paid someone to train you in mindfulness, I strongly suggest that you let go of that list and you get your money's worth from the teacher and you drop it and you do what you can do to get back to the breath. And, you know, when we start mindfulness, you, you know, I think you're right. We, we think that we're going to be here in this nice blissed out states of oneness. And actually what we're here is we're looping around and just discovering like how busy our mind is, how judgy we are, how difficult it is le to let go of the thinking. Yeah. Um, but then as we progress, my experience is that that loop gets, gets smaller and smaller. Uh, and it's because we, get, we learn how to learn. Yeah, we learn how to drop. We learn more about gentleness. We learn more about our mind states. We get rid of the fluff more quickly. Sometimes we reveal, you know, the deeper, more meaty, more problematic habits. But again, we've got to go through that landscape again and again so we can learn what do we want to prune back, which are the neural networks that are easy to work with, the newly formed habits, and which is the deeper rooted stuff, which is where the real transformation comes. And all with compassion. Bit, put a big heart yeah. over this. <laughs> and, you know, these are the brain networks. I mean, this is really almost a diagram taken from Hassan Kant's research. Attention network comes on. Default mode network comes on, say its network goes bing, 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 and then we re harness the attention. It's fascinating and mm. simplifies so much uh, confusion around mindfulness.